America is in the midst of three simultaneous crises. First, we have a once in a century viral pandemic that's infected at least 11 million worldwide. This includes more than 3 million US infections that have resulted in over 130,000 American deaths. Second, as a result of the pandemic and the economic shutdowns federal and state governments have deployed to try to control it, we're experiencing a pronounced economic downturn, the likes of which have been unseen in the United States since the 1930s. And in the midst of this pandemic and recession, the nation has also been racked by protests, demonstrations, and riots in the wake of the police killing of George Floyd. Our cup runneth over, but not in a good way. To help us unpack and make sense of some of the issues arising from these crises, I invited Harry Holzer to join me to discuss several papers and articles he has authored in the last year on topics related to race, crime, and the economy. Harry is the John LaFarge Jr. Professor of Public Policy at Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy. He's also one of the nation's leading experts on employment and labor market economics for low-wage workers. Anyone familiar with AEI's work will recognize Harry as a frequent interlocutor, collaborator, and contributor with AEI scholars working on diverse policy questions related to workforce development, poverty, and economics. Prior to joining Georgetown University, Harry served as the chief economist at the U.S. Department of Labor and taught economics at Michigan State University. He's also a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution and was a founding faculty director of the Georgetown Center on Poverty and Inequality. He is a true institution on the Washington, D.C. policy scene and a trusted resource for insight, knowledge, and analysis relating to some of the thorniest issues facing American society today. Harry Holzer, thanks for joining us on Hardly Working. Thank you for having me, Brett. I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to have you on, Harry. I think the first time I encountered you was probably at an Urban Institute event on prisoner reentry in the early 2000s. And one thing that has that struck me at that gathering and has continued to strike me over the years is that you have this refusal to turn away from evidence and an insistence that that evidence should really form the foundation of public policy, kind of irrespective of the aspirations of the policymakers. You know, like we have evidence-based policymaking and not policy-based evidence-making. And that has has really struck me about your work over the years is just a, a really uncompromising insistence on focusing on evidence. So today we're going to talk about two recent pieces that you put out. The first that I want you to talk with us about is a recent article on the general topic of racial disparities in the United States, which bears all the hallmarks of that evidence focus that we that I just talked about. And then you put out a more narrowly focused piece on the question of race, crime, and policing. So I want to get into both of those. But first, I'd like you to give us a little bit of Harry Holzer 101 biography. This is a podcast about vocation, career, and work. And I always like to hear from guests how they got to where they are. Well, thank you, Brent. Thank you for giving me that opportunity to talk about about those issues. My background is a little different than I think many people in our world and of our generation. I grew up on a farm uh, in a rural area on a chicken farm, an old-fashioned poultry farm with a long chicken coop in the backyard. I actually grew up thinking that everybody's backyard smelled like that, which was not the case. Um, my parents are immigrants. My parents were Holocaust survivors from Poland. And I think that gave me uh, a sense early in life that some people live with great hardships and, and it's possible to make life better with sensible policies. It's also possible to make people's lives much, much worse. And it gave me an instinctive distrust of strong ideologies on either the left or the right. And it pushed me towards kind of the center left place that I've been at most of my life. And I decided quite early on, even in high school, that I thought economics was a good place to be because economics is is, is very important. And and especially if you want people to have good livelihoods, uh, that the place to do that was labor economic. And so I've I've been a labor economist for most of my career, nearly 40 years since I finished my PhD. And and especially I've worked in the the lower end of the labor market where people do have a lot of difficulties. Uh, gaining jobs, keeping jobs, and especially bringing home sufficient levels of earnings to support themselves and their families. But that's been that's been the animating set of issues for me my entire career, and, and it continues to be. So just let me ask one question about, because I didn't know that about your family. And 
it also seems like that background would sort of lend a seriousness about life too, and a kind of an impatience with people who aren't serious about life. I think I see that in you. Do Is that part of your makeup? I think that's right. And it, and it leaves me being impatient uh, with lots of people, and you've observed me uh, being that way at many times, sometimes a little too much. Uh, it meant, for instance, that I never had much patience for the members of my profession that did really abstract theory or things which can't remotely contribute uh, to good policy making. So it leaves me very impatient with, with those folks. Uh, we don't have the time and resources uh, to waste. But again, but it also made me distrustful and impatient with folks who go overboard uh, way beyond what the evidence says. And, and as you indicated, sort of often substituting ideology uh, for good evidence. And I, I have problems with those folks as well. Very interesting. Okay. So to get us started on the, the heart of our discussion here, I just want to read the first paragraph from the Hill article and then uh, let you roll through that article, um, because I think I, the way you framed this, I think, is so interesting. So with your tongue, I assume, uh, planted firmly in your cheek, you write, America has just discovered that large disparities between whites and blacks exist in virtually all major life outcomes, including health, education, income, and wealth. This has been true for many generations, frankly, and it should not have taken us so long to figure it out. So then you go on to talk about the two stories. So tell us what are the two stories that Americans tell themselves about racial disparities? Well, there is the progressive story which right now, uh, in, in this moment filled with protests and, uh, and, and some legitimate anger, the progressive story seems to be the dominant framing right now. And the progressive story is, is one primarily of constrained opportunity, that African Americans have not had the opportunities in life that most white Americans have. And of course, there's always a question of well, how much of this is really about race and how much of it is about family income. Uh, and it's about both, right? When you, when you compare whites and blacks on average at the same income level, some of the gaps narrow, a lot of them narrow, but, but they tend not to disappear. Um, but the story is about, about uh, racism, uh, especially historical racism, that inhibited the ability of African Americans to gain good education, uh, high quality jobs, to invest in housing, which, of course, is one of the key ways that Americans build wealth over time and across generations. So all those things were, were strongly inhibited. Now, of course, things started to get better in the 50s and especially the 60s after the Civil Rights Act. But some of that continued to be the case. A lot of bias, what people sometimes call implicit bias, unconscious bias and stereotypes by which we limit African-American opportunity in schools, uh, in the workplace, and of course, uh, uh, injustice in, in the criminal justice system, uh, locking up way too many African-Americans. So all those things reflect uh, a lack of opportunity, uh, that white Americans have access to many more opportunities, face many fewer of those barriers, while African-Americans don't. And the historical legacy of all of those biases and all those barriers contribute a lot to many of the disparities we see today. So that's the progressive story around racial disparities. And there's a lot of power in it, obviously. There's, uh, there's a lot of truth in that. So tell us now what the conservative story is on racial disparities. Well, the conservative story tends to put somewhat less weight on opportunity denied in a bias. It doesn't dismiss it. And one doesn't have to pick one or the other necessarily. Uh, but it talks more about a set of behaviors and characteristics that African Americans have, uh, in some times, some cases, adopted, often in response to their perception of low opportunity. But uh, I would start with I, I would focus on four. Let's call them even either behaviors or characteristics. The first one is what we call the achievement gap, and of course, by the way, uh, uh, the achievement gap is not something that only conservatives have talked about in the last few decades. People across the political spectrum. Now it's just fallen out of favor to talk about it. But it's very simply that African Americans uh, do worse on measures of educational uh, accomplishment that usually include grades and test scores. And that that achievement gap opens up actually quite early in life, often in, in people's homes before they reach kindergarten. But then when they get to kindergarten in K through 12, uh, it either grows or gets more entrenched because of 
segregated schools and, and the like. But the achievement gap is the first issue. Uh, and I think empirically, it's very important in explaining several disparities. But the second gap then is employment, that starting at age 16, if you look at any longitudinal data, very quickly, a gap emerges in employment uh, and labor force participation uh, that whites at almost all income levels start working more than African Americans do. Uh, and, and again, some of that is, you could say, is discrimination or opportunity denied. But there does seem to be some choice made to not even set foot in the labor market and to pursue those options. Then, of course, uh, a third disparity uh, is, is one that we've talked about, incarceration, but it's really preceded by crime. Uh, and the very high crime rates in the African-American community, they are not as bad as they used to be. Uh, crime was really terrible in the 70s, 80s, early 90s. Uh, we have managed to bring it down. But it's that high crime uh, that has really led to most of the huge gap, the disparities in incarceration. Some of that might reflect racism in the criminal justice system, et cetera, but, but a lot of it does have to do with commission of crime. And finally, the tendency of so many African-American children, close to 70%, to be raised in families uh, without two parents, single-parent families, usually single moms, often low-income single moms, uh, maybe because they can't find uh, partners in life, marriage partners who have good employment records, good education records, et cetera. Uh, but if you add together all four of those things, that's a lot of disparities, at least somewhat related to the choices people make or, or, or that they inherit. Um, and of course, my view is it can't be either or. There is clearly some evidence of, of barriers to opportunity. There's also clearly evidence of these behavioral choices or, or other characteristics, and we need to take all of them seriously. Well, that brings us to the policy side of this, uh, which you kind of lay out a few things that we need to be paying attention to if we're serious about trying to reduce this gap between blacks and whites in America. So why don't you talk about that? Well, you know, my approach is is all of the above. Uh, There is no silver bullet that's going to magically solve this problem. To the extent that we have legacies of historical racism and that it still exists in our education systems, our criminal justice systems, uh, among employment behaviors, we have to confront it and deal with it. But that alone is not the full problem. We do have to keep working on reducing achievement gaps uh, and giving black children access to strong pre-K programs, to more higher quality K through 12 possibilities of more efforts in college. We need to put more resources uh, into all of the things. But at the same time, to really also work hard on raising employment opportunities uh, for young people, sometimes that means picking up a skill or a craft rather than necessarily expecting everybody to get a four-year college degree and other things. And, And it's hard for us to encourage marriage because the tools that we have, they work a little bit. They're not terribly cost effective. But I do not reject that out of hand as yet one more thing uh, that we can try to do to help give people good starts in life and, and give them better opportunities for better outcomes. Okay. So that sort of gives us the kind of the big picture of the way that you think about racial disparities in the United States um, and that both the progressive vision and the conservative vision have elements within them that are undeniably true and have to be addressed. I noticed that at one point in your in your Hill piece, you you say the progressives and conservatives have to stop fighting each other. What would that look like? Well, you know, uh, Brent, you and I have been involved in some efforts to do that. And two institutions that that we are affiliated with, AEI on the right and Brookings kind of on on the left, uh, have tried to do that on a number of cases and have put together these joint groups and they write these nice reports with a lot of comedy and and they tend not to be implemented. I think, frankly, there's so much ideology uh, Mm -hmm. right now and so much polarization uh, in the world around us, uh, both in government, on Capitol Hill, and uh, more broadly. You know, I, I think I'm a Democrat. I'm known as a Democrat in this town. I served in the Clinton administration, as you know. Uh, I, I will say that I find the other side, the other party, so dug in on, on refusing to do anything positive if it costs more money, you know, and the absolute refusal to, to raise tax revenues to fund the programs we already have, like Social Security and Medicare, much less other things. Uh, so so I, find, I find those ideologies become a barrier 
it's easy to write nice reports where we all come together, but finding the political will to implement those. And, and I would say, you know, on, on the left right now uh, and in my party, there's also a, a growing impatience with, with even considering anything that conservatives say. So writing the reports is the easy part, actually getting yeah. people to, to do it. Now, now, at the state level, you know, people are more pragmatic often, even though, again, we have clearly entrenched red states and blue states. But, you know, you find governors and state legislatures somewhat less polarized than we are at the federal level. Um, and maybe that's often the place to focus to try to try to, and, and, and some good things have happened uh, in, in both kinds of states. Maybe give us a little hope. And, you know, one thing is uh, you and I met uh, almost 20 years ago uh, in an event on uh, helping ex-offenders re-enter. And one of the most positive things, I think, is that on both the left and the right, people have come to see uh, the huge costs associated with mass incarceration, you know, spending billions upon billions of dollars to make people unemployable, you know, violates the principles both of the left and the right and of almost any thinking person. So, so that always gives me some hope. I think the fact that they have joined together often in, in the political world, you, you start to see some, some fruits of, of those efforts to come together at the federal level and at state and local levels as well. Yeah, that's a good segue to discussing your paper on race, crime, and policing, um, which is without question, the top or the second hottest topic in America right now, depending on coronavirus or policing. Those are the two issues. But we've been through a massive sort of change in the way the public is thinking about this uh, in such a, what it feels like to me, an incredibly short period of time uh, in the last six weeks, uh, there's just been a a sea change in the conversation about policing and crime. So you lay out, I think you've got four kind of buckets of thinking about evidence in this field. And I'm just going to read the headings from those four buckets that you put into your paper. And I'd like you to unpack them because I think I found it incredibly valuable. And I think that in looking hard at the data, we can see just how really complicated this is, that simple solutions, which could either be defund the police or lock them up, that is not a helpful frame for where we are on, uh, on the policing issue. So here's the first heading for the, your summary of the extant quantitative research uh, on race, crime, and policing. While serious or violent crime has declined quite dramatically in the past three decades, the commission of and victimhood associated with such crimes remains relatively higher among African Americans than other racial groups. So tell us what the data tells us about who actually commits and is victimized by crime. Well, so I I looked at the two main federal sources of data, the uniform crime reports, which the FBI puts together, mostly from local law enforcement agencies. And then there's something called a national victimization survey where you ask individuals, uh, have, have you been victimized by crime and what kind? Uh, both of those data sources have flaws. Uh, both of them have, have leave some groups out. Both of them are potentially subject to bias uh, or imperfect perceptions uh, or whatever. Having said all that, both of them suggest uh, much higher rates of violent crime in the African-American community, again, both among offenders and among victims. Uh, in the uniform crime reports, the disparity is enormous, uh, that the rate of, say, homicide as an offense, as well as victimhood, is, is five to six times as high in the African-American community as in the white community. It's a huge disparity. Now, again, and granting some of that might be overblown by the biases of, of the local uh, agencies reporting. You look at the, the victimization survey, the numbers are, are a little over two to one in terms of a whole range of violent crimes. But of course, keeping in mind, uh, if you are a victim of homicide, you won't be taking that survey because you will no longer be alive. Uh, so I'm inclined to believe that the truth is likely somewhere in between those two. And, and the truth likely varies from exact crime category to another. But we can't escape the fact. And, and let me be clear, I, you know, we I have to say this, in no way do these crime rates justify what happened to George Floyd or Rayshard Brooks? You, know, you, you 
we have instances, and, and, and those are, appear not to be purely isolated. You, you, have, you have instances where, where the racism on the part of police seem to be so stark uh, and, and the punishments inflicted are so out of proportion to whatever crime they might have. There's no justification for that at all. And, and we do have to think about reforms in policing to deal with that. Nevertheless, you have to think about when crime rates were very, very high in the 70s and 80s, the people who suffered most from that crime are low-income folks and, and, and people of color. They were terrorized. Uh, and there's, there's a book, a wonderful book on this uh, by James Foreman Jr. called Locking Up Our Own, where he documents in the 70s and 80s uh, the fact that the African-American community, working class, poor, lower middle class, were so terrorized by crime that they were demanding higher stronger policing and higher incarceration rates didn't turn out necessarily the way they had wanted. Uh, but that level of crime is, is, is also unacceptable. We have some cities where we've seen some increases in the last five, six years. Baltimore and Chicago leap to mind, but they're not the only ones. Um, however we do this, however we reform policing to eliminate the abuses, we can't do it in a way that might cripple policing uh, and lead violent crime to resurface again. And, and there's another wonderful book by a, a sociologist at Princeton named Patrick Sharkey uh, called Uneasy Peace. And he talks a lot about the decline in crime and how much better the lives of people in these lower income neighborhoods, people of color, have been because of the decline, even though they sometimes feel abused by the police, uh, and, and some do. Uh, but still, it's a sea change. And, and we want to make sure that that doesn't recur. Yeah, you talked about, you know, the relative to uh, non-Black communities, you have these elevated rates of crime. How much has crime come down? Do you have that uh, off the top of your head in African-American communities? Um, violent crime has declined by over 50 percent. It peaked in the early 90s. And by the way, the early 90s were a period when you had what some people call the crack wars going on, uh, you know, around public housing developments and, and really low-income city neighborhoods. So it, it's down by by roughly two thirds in terms of the most violent categories, and mm. maybe maybe by somewhat less in other kinds of property crimes and things like that. It's, it's an enormous benefit that we don't want to lose. But again, there remains things to do, and and yeah. crime rates of victimization remain too high uh, in the African American community and, and elsewhere too. Yeah, and I also want to echo what you said about uh, George Floyd. Uh, I I don't think you can draw a connection between the kinds of police behavior that we saw with George Floyd and in the other cases and the conclusion that harsh policing techniques are necessary in order to, to get the kinds of crime reductions that you're talking about. So let's, let's go on to the, the second bucket here, which was, uh, gets to this kind of police tactics uh, question. And you say many new policing tactics since the 1990s appear effective at reducing crime, at least in the short term, so the harshest ones do not. So tell us about that. Um, we did some things that really worked, it sounds like, but that some of the more punitive measures that, that often kind of viscerally appeal to people don't seem to be the ones that work. They seem to be the ones that exacerbate. I, I think that's correct. Now, I'm not a criminologist by background, uh, so most of what I know about this comes from a National Academies of Science report uh, that came out in 2017. And what those reports do is they, they bring together the top academics in those fields, try to summarize what the research shows us as of that point in time. Uh, and, what they can, and they rely heavily on, on a set of what we call meta-analyses, uh, surveys of, of the empirical literature uh, by a scholar named Anthony Braga. He used to be at the Harvard Kennedy School, now he's at Northeastern. Uh, and what the data seem to show is that a number of tactics that the police started using uh, in the 1990s did seem somewhat effective at bringing crime down. Uh, these tactics are things like what they call uh, proactive policing, trying to anticipate where the problems are going to occur and what to do about them. They call it focused deterrence. You know, again, trying to deter people in those locales, hotspots policing, you know, the neighborhoods where you know the highest crime rates exist. Uh, and other things, even stop and frisk, which I talk about a little later in the paper. There's some evidence that stop and frisk in some cases, uh, it, it can reduce crime, although generally not at the citywide level. Um, but at the same time, the really the harshest methods, like broken windows policing, where the police tolerate no infraction whatsoever, 
especially when it targets individuals and often targets individuals of colors, that does not seem to be very effective. If anything, the more effective tactics tend more towards what people call community policing, working hand in hand with the local neighborhood, local community, building goodwill, building trust, uh, building relationships. So, so those communities will in fact not fear the police, but they will rely on them more heavily. Those tactics seem more effective at reducing crime. And, and the other tactics like broken windows policing and not only tend to be ineffective, but they tend to be very costly because they poison the atmosphere in the communities and they reduce trust between members of the community and the police. And I think that turns out to be costly in and of itself and, and also reduces the effectiveness of the, of the policing tactics. So it, it really struck me when I was reading this, that I was thinking um, about you know, that all of these policies arose out of the crime waves of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, as you, as you indicated. And it feels to me like we're still fighting the last war on crime, um, you know, that we, we have a significantly reduced level of criminal activity and violent crime in the United States, but we still, we're still policing like we have a high rate. Would you agree with that? Or do you think that's off the mark? I agree with that. And of course, there's many times in life when that happens, right? Uh, there's many times when we're, when we're fighting the last war and the pendulum swings too far. Yes, I think that's true. You look at the level of funding for police, which has gone up dramatically, but much more the tactics, the militarization of yeah. policing that we have allowed to occur. It is like we're fighting the last war. It is like we're fighting, still fighting the crack wars of the 80s and the early 90s. The pendulum has swung too far, and that kind of policing, I think, just imposes many more costs than it generates benefits. And so, you know, costs on the community and the lives of people. And, and you and I, of course, came to the same conclusion on incarceration. It might well be that incarceration somewhat contributed to the drop in crime we've observed in the last 25 to 30 years. But the price was very high. And the price yeah. that we imposed on those families and those communities, those individuals, ruining the lives of, and, and not only the people whom we've locked up, but what it's done to their children and their grandchildren, their neighborhoods. Unfortunately, that happens, that the pendulum swings from one extreme to the other. Uh, and, and we want to try to bring that pendulum back, but in a sensible way, not to a way that, that, that causes crime to, to reappear. Yeah, I think there's a big danger of, uh, you know, unfortunately, we're in a federal system, so you don't, <laughs> you won't have a nationalized policy on this, hopefully. Uh, but in some jurisdictions, you might see, you know, the pendulum swing too far the other way and wind up with a backlash that takes us back to those more punitive policies that we uh, impose. The third area that you address is, uh, the heading reads, though the research findings remain fixed, there is growing statistical evidence of racial bias in use of force among police. Um, talk about that one. That's the hot issue. So right, tell us right. Well, so I'd say the, the results remain mixed. Um, yeah. they're, they're not fixed. They're evolving. Look, if you look at as a percentage of the population, the fractions of blacks who experience force by the police, whether it's lethal or non-lethal, the numbers are much higher. Um, and and many many tabulations have shown that. But when you start looking more closely at the data. Uh, there's a few things that you see in some studies. Uh, and by the way, I think the best study out there right now is by an economist. Of course, I'm going to like it by an economist named Roland Fryer, uh, who's at Harvard right now, African-American economist, who's a very, very good scholar. Uh, and he analyzed data from four cities, uh, and he looked at incidents of contact between the police and whites versus blacks. And he did find that actually a non-lethal force he found these incidents were as much as 50% higher for African-Americans in terms of their contacts with the police. Some people would think that's actually much less than they might have expected. He found it 50% higher. And then when he started controlling for things like crime in the locality, the disparity reduced, but it didn't disappear. Actually, for, for lethal use of force, um, he, he didn't find any, any higher rates of force in those communities. Uh, and there have been some other studies, I think, uh, suggesting similar things. So, so there is some evidence of bias, but I think you have to interpret very carefully what's going on in Fryer's study and some others. And two things. Number one, as soon as you start controlling for crime, the disparities are going to lessen, right? We know that there's many more cases of police use of force in the African-American community uh, 
But the crime rates there are higher too. And they believe consciously or unconsciously the police that they need to exercise force to try to keep those uh, those streets safe. But the other thing is when you look at per incident of contact between whites and police versus blacks and police, there simply is a lot more contact that the police choose to have with African-Americans, often young African-American men. They say in part because the crime rates are so much higher. So when you, in some sense, when you control for that, when you look per incident of contact, you're going to be eliminating a major source of bias because the contacts are so much more frequent among blacks than whites. And that gets us into the whole issue that I, that I talked about in that part of the paper. Uh, the contacts are higher because the crime rates are higher. And the police are clearly engaging in what some people call racial profiling. Uh, economists call it statistical discrimination. When you don't know if a particular individual on the street is a risk, a danger, has been involved in crime, but you fall back on their average statistics, right? So if you're a young black male and you know that the crime rates are higher among young black men, you target them. Uh, and, and in some sense, the studies are almost accepting that as a reasonable approach, because when you control for crime, when you control for contact, you're kind of implicitly accepting. And I've come to the conclusion that that's, that's not a good policy, because it's simply an even, even you know, because stop and frisk, uh, is the clearest example of that. It clearly involves racial profiling of who should be stopped and frisked. If you look at the numbers, the vast majority of people stopped and frisked appear to be innocent. And you're just imposing large costs on, on those folks uh, and, and their civil liberties. And we all care about their civil liberties on both the left and the right. Uh, but again, and it, it embitters the community. So I end up concluding that on the one hand, you do want to take crime into account, but you don't want to use it in a way that in some sense, accepts racial profiling uh, as, as a legitimate way for the police to do business, as some of these studies seem to do. So it's complex. Very complex. I mean, uh, when you think about kind of the policy implications of that, how would you, I mean, I, you may not have an answer. I, if you had an answer, uh, you'd be retired now, I suppose, living off the royalties. But what is the policy conclusion to draw from the fact that racial profiling is wrong and imposes costs. And to some degree, it has to factor into police behavior, if I understand that's what you're saying. So how do you, what do you do with it? I mean, how would you balance that? It's hard to pull it off. I think you encourage the police to lean much more heavily on those methods analyzed in the National Academies report that seem to be effective without this harsh punishment, without this very harsh racial profiling. For instance, hotspots policing, you know certain locales do have higher crime rates. It makes sense to focus on them. If you have gang members or known violent offenders, you focus more on them. But just because a, a young black man is walking down the street with a hoodie in those neighborhoods, that's not enough. And interestingly, uh, you know, New York City is such an interesting example here. But we know that New York City in the 90s under uh, Mayor Giuliani, who of course has moved on to other uh, activities these days, crime dropped, and crime was dropping everywhere, right? In that period of time, like the second half, of the nineties and beyond. A lot of people gave Giuliani credit, and he had uh, uh, he he had a police commissioner, I believe his name was Bratton, uh, who was often given credit for that crime, but he leaned very heavily on, on racial profiling and, and those harsher methods and gained some success. He came back, he did a second stint as police commissioner. And the second time around, much more recently, he changed his tune uh, and he, he de-emphasized racial profiling and stop and frisk. And he had become convinced of the need to do this much more in a community friendly way. It was, on, it was in the Bloomberg administration. Uh, I think he, he did his second stint. And so that's to me an interesting case of a guy who back in the 90s did believe in, in stop and frisk and racial profiling, came to see how costly it is. And, and I think he's managed to do it in ways that have not led to a big resurgence of crime in New York City. Now, again, Chicago, Baltimore, some of these other cities, uh, it's been tougher there. It's been tougher in the environments. But again, that, you know, we want to, wherever, however we can encourage the police to engage in the effective methods, not the harshest methods. That's what yeah, and I, I, I just think focusing on these costs is so important because, I, you know, we don't focus on the costs. We don't focus on what does it mean for people to be deprived of civil liberties. We don't focus enough on 
the shattering effect of these uh, horrendous events and what they do to communities and families. And it seems like, you know, there's a line in your paper that says, please contact the individuals are higher among uh, Blacks than others, even when no crime appears to have occurred. And to me, that's the setup. That's the setup for these incidents that spin out of control are these incidental contacts uh, between police and members of the community. They're taken by surprise. They haven't done anything and they react negatively out. And many times I think out of fear that what's going to happen to them, they've read about in the headlines. And so it's, uh, we've got to focus on that. I think that there is this sort of accumulated trauma within the African-American community that helps feed these negative reactive cycles, I guess you'd call them, uh, in contacts with police. I, I think that's correct, you know, and look, let's face it, the police are aware of what the data look like uh, and the racial gaps in commission of crime. And, and many of them remember or certainly know about the violence of the 80s and the early 90s uh, that I think condition their perceptions, whether consciously or unconsciously. Um, yeah, I, I think it's driven by fear. Uh, mm -hmm. now, you know, and, and sometimes it is. We know in the case of George Floyd, there was an incident with a, with a counterfeit $20 bill that led to this. Whether he even knew that the bill was counterfeit, who knows? Um, and, and there is always a little evidence of resisting uh, arrest or resisting something that the police do. Nevertheless, that doesn't justify uh, and as you said, it's so much harmful. It is driven by fear. Uh, it is driven by terrible stereotypes and, and biases. You know, and, and some people point to data and say, you know, everyone says, look, you got to do more training of the police to resist their biases in these situations and their worst fears. Is that training effective? I don't know. I don't know how many studies we have of that. And, you know, you're right. If, if, if the police fear that potentially there's a bullet coming in their direction, of course, there was no bullet that was going to come from George Floyd. Rayshard Brooks was running away. He was shot in the back. And so, you know, again, whatever the fears are that might lead to these, uh, they, they have become poison uh, in some way. And again, how do you untangle the legitimate parts of good policing without the poisonous biases, uh, even hatred that lead to these excesses? Um, in, in some places, again, I looked in New York City under, under Commissioner Ratton as a place where they've started to disentangle those things. And we have a lot more work to do in many other places. Yeah, which is a, a, a good lead in to the final, the final piece of your paper, which is involves alternatives to policing that involve mental health and community services or that generate employment for low income youth and men. And I'd like you to talk about that. And I it, just to wrap up the previous point, the, the effects of trauma are not just in the community. I think if you're a police officer working in a high crime neighborhood, you're pretty traumatized yourself um, in terms of repeated exposure to really bad things that condition responses. Um, and that's what strikes me is that like there's this tinderbox of police on edge and communities on edge. Um, and those folks are coming into contact with one another and it's an explosive uh, combination. So talk about, talk about some of the strategies on either the police or the community side that might help us to sort of ratchet down um, the levels of, of conflict, anxiety, fear uh, in communities. What you hear about a lot these days are instead of the harshest policing, maybe providing more mental health services to people in these situations where, where it, it seems likely that the so-called offender, the people, the police are on, might have mental health issues, tra their own traumas from the past. And, and there's a whole growing literature on community involvement rather than pure policing, pure uses of force. Now, this is not my area of expertise. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm reading this literature. And, and again, Patrick Sharkey has written in his book about positive examples. My sense is that, you know, in terms of evidence, that there is some positive evidence in these approaches, but we haven't done a lot of this stuff at scale. And as, as good evaluators of evidence, you and I both know that it's easier sometimes to find little gems that work, that are cost-effective, and harder to scale up these 
So I would defer to people who, who spend their life. I think we should continue that research and experiment and evaluate with those yeah. approaches, mental health approaches or community approaches uh, at larger scale. I do know a little more about the employment stuff because that is in my area of expertise. And, and there's an area we all, you don't always have great success stories. In, or uh, ever, or ever, Harry. Or ever. Ever. Well, sometimes, sometimes you do. Uh, and, and what I, an interesting area in the whole area of summer youth employment programs, mm. if you had asked me 10 years ago, you know, these summer youth employment programs for high school kids, you know, six, six weeks of, of kind of part-time or full-time uh, employment, I would have said, ah, those things are a waste. You know, the, those kids aren't doing anything meaningful. It's not going to improve their employment or skills over time. I've completely changed my mind about that because there have been a number of really rigorous studies using the best methods, you know, random assignment or, or lottery-based studies uh, over and over, which in fact say, yes, they don't do much to raise employment, but they reduce crime, they reduce arrests, they even reduce homicides for these young people. And there's evidence, at least from three cities, from Boston, New York, and Chicago, big programs in all these places, and that seem to have these remarkable effects. You take those kids out, you prevent them from engaging in crime in those summers, and, then, and there seems to be a lasting bump from those things happening. So there's a, a rare success story. We wow, ought to be that's... investing much more in, in those kinds of programs, and, and especially for the more at-risk youth. That's terrific, because uh, I shared uh, skepticism. I mean, we typically, about summer youth, because we typically think about the employment effects uh, of them, which are not dramatic, but the social effects, you know, that would be a very worthwhile investment for major cities to really go big on summer youth employment as a violence reduction. And, and you know, sh should, all of the, should all of those be uh, financed with funds that were otherwise going to the police? I don't know. That depends on the budget yeah. in any particular city. But to me, it's very encouraging. And there's other programs. So in my paper, I cited a program called Becoming a Man, which has been piloted in Chicago. And that's a different, that's less of an employment-based approach. It's, it's basically what, what people call cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, which you can apparently do for quite low cost. You teach these young men to be less reactive in a potential situation where they're insulted or there's some potential conflict, you teach them to take a deep breath, maybe walk away. Maybe I should do some of that more. Uh, the initial evidence is really very positive. It's been done at a small level. I want to see them try to scale it. And, and there, you know, there are a, a group of outstanding scholars at the University of Chicago, you know, Jens Ludwig and some others, uh, have evaluated, and it's really encouraging. So where we've already done it at scale, like summer youth employment, let's do it. Where we haven't yet done it at scale, let's try it in scale uh, and, and see what happens. But let's really make a commitment to sort of fish out the best approaches in that area and the approaches that can be scaled up and that might work. Yeah. And, I, and speaking of CBT, I, it, what flashed across my head was, you know, maybe some CBT for police forces as well. Maybe. Uh, if, in fact, they're traumatized in the way that you yeah. describe. So, yes, yes, that might exactly be to de-escalate quickly yes. in situations where some conflict, and, and, and again, there was some conflict in the case of George Floyd and, and Ray Shard Brooks. It shouldn't have gone the way they did yeah. once that conflict and resistance uh, appeared. We're going to switch topics here uh, real quickly at the end, because you can never have a podcast these days that doesn't take up the topic of COVID. And you've written some interesting things on COVID and being careful about reopening too quickly, the economic impact of moving too quickly. Uh, and it really does look like it, you were spot on. So tell us about that article. Well, I was, I was simply um, guesstimating what would happen if we reopened too quickly. And it was speculative. It was like, if we reopen too quickly in a way that causes the virus to spike again, what you might call it a second wave, or maybe for some places a, a first serious wave, that that would be very economically costly. We know that the initial lockdowns in March and April were very costly. They would have been a lot worse had the government not pumped about $3 trillion into all kinds of relief efforts. Uh, and, and that was a massive amount of money. And I, I think it was likely well spent, uh, cost effectively spent. But I had the sense in May that instead of taking a very careful step-by-step -step approach, that a lot of places were, were just pulling the plug. And some of these places, you know, Florida, Texas, the issue become very politicized, and we know, you know we, we have a president who was actively pushing and politicizing the reopening. Um, and it was clear to me around Memorial Day that, that it was coming too quickly. 
And that I thought two things w- would happen. Uh, number one, if the cases were rising, customers would be scared to show up uh, in some places. And, and I think that's the case in a lot of places in retail establishments and hospitality, that they see the numbers bumping up and they're scared. Young people, uh, and we know some of our own kids are, are less frightened than maybe should be. You know, so that's why a lot of the spike right now is among 20 and 30 year olds can tolerate the virus pretty well, but they pass it on to other people. Uh, but the second thing I said, this would likely cause a, a second set of shutdowns. And I thought the second set of shutdowns could be costlier than the first. Because first of all, mm-hmm. it's hard for businesses. You know, there are fixed costs in reopening and shutting down for, for establishments. Um, a lot of expenses you know, have to be in the reopening. Uh, and that if that was wasted, boy, the second time around, the businesses themselves will be much more careful. And consumers, uh, if consumers start going out and then they get the virus or see lots of viruses around them, they're going to feel burned by this. So I thought that the long-term costs, uh, if there's a second spike in cases and, and, and another set of closures, that it would make it that much harder to dig out of our hole economically down the road. And unfortunately, that, that's what appears to be happening. Uh, you know, something close to 30 states are seeing increasing numbers of cases. And you will, in many of those places, at a minimum, you'll have shutdowns reimposed in some sectors like bars and restaurants, uh, but perhaps beyond that. And, and that's going to be very costly the second time around. Uh, and it will make it harder to dig out uh, when we come out of that, whenever that will be. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, those sectors that you mentioned, restaurants and bars and um, retail, are both extremely important. They employ a lot of people and they're very fragile because they operate on narrow margins. That's right. Um, And we know, so we know that a lot of retailers will likely, we already had a trend towards online shopping, less brick and mortar in person, more warehousing and transportation. I've always thought that trend was going to accelerate because of this, you know, stores that were going to do that gradually are going to do it now more rapidly. That, of course, is a very different skill set for the workers uh, involved to get those jobs. Uh, that's going to lead to worker dislocations. Um, I, think, I think there will permanently be a lot more takeout uh, and delivery for a lot of these restaurants. Of course, you know, when you talk about the margin, you know, we know that one of the restaurants make a lot of money on alcohol, right? And, and for better or worse, that's not going to be a big part of the delivery scene. So that and, and the reduced uh, seeding, yeah, that's going to make uh, some of these businesses, makes their business model no longer profitable enough to stay in business. And of course, and it's the permanent reorganizations and the permanent closures that will really impose big costs on workers because we have a lot of evidence on this that when workers permanently lose jobs, it hurts them for years to come. With sure. employment, reduced earnings, all kinds of mental health issues better to live with temporary layoffs wherever we can. But now a lot of those businesses are, I think, going to go out of business. Hard to tell how many. There's a very good economist uh, at the University of Chicago named Steve Davis, who has a paper predicting 30 to 40% of, of layoffs will end up being permanent. You know, I, I think those are debatable. I mean, his estimates are at best guesstimates, uh, but, but that's where the huge costs are going to be. Not to mention the young people, you know, re-entering a labor market, leave finishing school and just re-entering under terrible circumstances. We know now, we know from the Great Recession and earlier, re-entering a labor market, even with a college degree, under a really bad recession, just imposes quite long-term costs on people. Maybe a way to help some of those people go back and, and get an additional credential or additional skill that might be better time, better ways to spend that time. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you have to settle an argument over the pandemic unemployment compensation for me. I have been talking and writing a lot about looking at those as an investment in social solidarity and like really caring for what we call essential workers. Um, We don't actually pay them or treat them typically as essential. Uh, But, you know, this is a way of saying we care about you and you're important to the to the society and the way that we're, you know, the economy and so on. Uh, and Repub- some Republicans, not all, and I think even a couple of Democrats have been really critical of that level of, uh, of unemployment compensation and, and its disincentive to work. Um, what, do you, what do you make out of that debate? Well, I actually think that uh, unemployment insurance to date has been mostly a great success story. It has been perhaps the primary 
policy lever that has enabled people to not get hurt really badly at the bottom, say the bottom quarter, bottom third of the labor market. And it has for sure, this recession would have been dramatically worse had we not had that unemployment insurance. It keeps people afloat. It keeps them spending money on. on. So I, I think it's mostly been a success story. Now, as we shift, however tentatively, into a period of recovery, and I often draw a difference between relief, pure relief and recovery, although the dividing line is, is actually a little blurry. You don't want people to have disincentives to work. Um, and you know, the reason, you know, the biggest issue has been the $600 bump up, 600 weekly, $600 weekly bump up. That's not, that was never the best way to do this. Uh, but the reason we went with that is you know, a much more sensible way would have been 90%, 95% replacement of the wages you have. But they couldn't do that for administrative reasons. You know, the, yeah. They couldn't redo the programming. So we chose the $600 approach. I think it, it has mostly been a success. But two things, going back to, we so said we need to avoid the extremes. Number one, you want to avoid the extreme of simply pulling the plug, letting these things expire at the end of the month and having that, that will be devastating. So all, you know, and especially in a period, if the caseload is going back up and, and the rehiring is going to be really limited, you know, those people need more than the kind of the flimsy level of support you get from regular UI. On the other hand, you know, for the people who do face some real possibilities of recall, you want them to accept. Now, I've always wondered if the disincentives are as bad as some people think, because if the employer offers to recall you and you refuse, you can be fired for that. And once you're fired, you lose your unemployment insurance, or at least that's the risk. And I thought, well, maybe that's enough incentive for people to go back and take those jobs. It may or may not be enough incentive. So I, I favor shifting, maintaining some enhanced unemployment insurance, maintaining both PUA, the extended eligibility, and PUC, but doing it a little more tied to local economic conditions. So in the places where you see little recovery, where you might see things actually worsening, continue to be very generous in those areas, five, $600 a week maintaining that. In the places where you see more reopening going on, ratchet it down somewhat lower. And maybe, maybe tying it to local regional unemployment rates, if not state rates. So the people who need it the most will continue to get a lot of support. The people for whom recall is a more realistic option would, would face somewhat better incentives. And, oh, and by the way, you said about the essential workers, we should be helping them too, whether it's through more education and training or simply expanding things like the earned income tax credit to give them an even bigger bump because they've been, they've been heroes. You know, they've gone to work and get lousy wages and benefits while others of us have stayed home to be safe. Uh, we need to not just give them lip service. We need to reward them uh, with real dollars. And I think it's possible. We have things like the earned income tax credit. You can do it as well for them. Well, I think that should be the last word because I agree with it completely. Yeah. And <laughs> when you and I agree, Brent, it ends all, all argument, all discussion. Uh, <laughs> Harry, I'm just so grateful that you're out there working on these issues and talking about them, writing about you're such an important voice on helping us to avoid the extremes, helping us to find the policies that work. So I'm, I'm really thankful for your work on all these topics that we've covered today. And I'm looking forward to have you on again soon. Next time you've got something interesting, make sure you send it my way so that we can have another chat. Thank you, Brent. I would, I would love to do that. And you are the kind of conservative that I often like to work with because we can often find a kind of sensible middle ground. So let's keep doing that. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Hardly Working. I'm your host, Brent Orell, and I hope you tune in next time to learn more about the state of workforce development in America. Be sure to like and subscribe to our podcast. Let us know at vocation at AEI.org if there are any topics you'd like us to cover. As always, we hope you find the job that fits so well, it feels like you're hardly working.